the Isle of Shepi. Shepi, the island of sheep. 350 years ago, this was a wild place, a marshland whose few inhabitants eked out a living in whatever way they could, from fishing, sheep farming, or from collecting eggs. For generation upon generation, life had always been lived thus, with no thought that it might someday change. But change it did, in August 1665. You like? Tis most fine. Tis a farming. My daughter will like that. She will think it most pretty. Mr. Cavendish, a word if you please. You're building a house? A shipyard to keep out the Dutch. The man in charge of this surveying work? One Mr. Samuel Pepys, Secretary to the Navy. I do believe that the problem is that we only have one hammer. The Sea Lords found the plans ambitious and expensive. The whole area being some 260 feet in length and 190 feet in width, uh, uh, and to include a carpenter's house, a uh, mast house, forge and storekeeper's house, and two gates and slips. Cost? 670. Pounds? Guineas? To Sheerness, where we walked up and down, laying out the ground to be taken in for a yard to lay provisions for cleaning and repairing of ships. And a most proper place it is for the purpose. would serve us well to keep the Dutch at bay. The Sea Lord Admiral was right. The new Sheerness shipyard and fort would serve the country well against the threat of Dutch invasion, once it was built. They need labourers, carriers for this fort, Work for months on end, we'll be rich. Well, not so poor, anyway. By June the following year, although the shipyard was near completion, the building of the all-important fort was way behind schedule. Men of war. Get word to the Admiralty, boy. But look sharp! Aye, sir. Up, and news brought to us that the Dutch are come up as high as the Nore. Then to the naval office, where Lord Brunker of the Admiralty came to us and Commander Pet of Chatham, who is in a very fearful stink for fear of the Dutch. This morning, Pet writes us word that Sheerness Fort is lost last night, and after two or three hours' dispute, the enemy hath possessed himself of the place. seems very remarkable to me, and of a great honour to the Dutch, that those of them that did go on shore killed none of our people, nor plundered their houses. 
A metal chain across the river was now all that lay between the invading Dutch and the English fleet at Chatham. When the second Dutch ship rammed the chain, it gave way. Words soon reached London and Samuel Pepys. The news is true. The Dutch have broken the chain and burned our ships, and particularly the Royal Charles. And the truth is, I do fear so much that the whole kingdom is undone. The Dutch dragged the Royal Charles, pride of the British fleet, back to Holland as a prize. The transom remains in Holland, at the Reich Museum in Amsterdam to this very day. Within four months, Edward Gregory, the clerk of the Czech at Chatham, writes of a considerable fortification with 30 guns being completed here at Sheerness. Never again would a foreign power be able to sail up the Thames without fear or hindrance. Wonderful buildings indeed, and perfect for repulsing foreign invasions. But where were the civilian workers needed to run and maintain such an establishment to be housed? The Navy would not provide them with accommodation. Where they ended up living was on decommissioned warships that were laid up in the river. The hulks. The Methodist preacher John Wesley visited the Hulks in 1767 and approved of what he saw. Such a town as many as these live in is scarce to be found again in England. In the dock adjoining the fort there are six old men of war. These are divided into small tenements with little chimneys and windows. In one of them, where we called, a man and his wife and six little children lived, and yet all the ship was sweet and tolerably clean, sweeter than most of the sailing ships that I have been in. However, Isaac Coffin, the dockyard commissioner, took a different view. The yard is a common resort of whores and rogues, both day and night. The conduct of the former is made all the more shameful and atrocious by the ready access to the gin shops on the old ships. If I or the Admiral were to entertain lady visitors, their eyes or ears could not fail to be shocked by the cursing and execrations of these abandoned prostitutes. <coughs> Thing. Two years later, Coffin had his way, and the residents of the Hulks were evicted. Mama, where are we going? Blue Town. A few years later, the Hulks were populated again, this time with prisoners. These were the Hulks described by Charles Dickens in Great Expectations. By the light of the torches, we saw the black hulk lying a little way from the mud of the shore, like a wicked Noah's Ark, cribbed and barred and moored by massive rusty chains. The prison ship seemed in my eyes to be ironed like the prisoners. <laughs> 